Um, oh, that's nice. <laughs> Um, I'm Shirley Ted, I'm your mental health specialist. I cover QMC and City. I'm hoping that some of you have seen me on some of your wards and you've met me. I'm also the uh, chair of our BAME staff network, which I've added this and I didn't add it on my first slide. I'm a social worker by background, which is probably quite unusual working in an acute physical hospital. But I'm a mental health social worker by background, 20 years of uh, working in the community in different areas in mental health. I'm also what's called a trained AMP, so I used to detain people under the Mental Health Act and I'm also a trained best interest assessor. So I get involved with lots of different things here at NUH, I come into, it was quite nice actually, I was saying to Vicky, her talking about case conferences and the rapid reviews, I get involved in quite a few case conferences in certain areas, you may have had to call me get, to get involved in some meetings, I get involved in some complex cases of people that are detained mainly around the legislation to ensure what we're doing is legal, to make sure what we're doing is in the patient's best interest, and also to ensure that yourselves are all covered in those procedures. So generally, I'll come and have a chat with you on the ward and say, have we ensured the patient has information? Have the patient, uh, have we ensured that their legal aspects, especially if they're detained under the Mental Health Act, we're covering those aspects? We obviously are not a psychiatric hospital, so where things are a lot more easier in a psychiatric hospital, it's a lot more difficult for us to cover that in an acute hospital for the obvious reasons. We're not set up for that. I won't go through too much of my whole CV because that's quite boring for everyone. What I did want to do this time around, so I did speak in the ADH conference last year. Um, one of our site matrons said, enough, she's out, she's had enough. I've heard her speak before, I'm out. <laughs> it's fine. Um, I, last year, I spoke on um, a piece of legislation that's come out. Um, it's called the Uses of Force Act. This year, considering we're doing a theme and a scenario, I thought it was best really to go through the MCA a bit more. So I apologise if I'm teaching you guys all to suck eggs. But the statement and the social worker thing in me, because people keep using the, the phrase, someone who lacks capacity, to do what? And you will always hear me, if I'm talking to you on the ward, if you say those words to me, like a flash, I will be coming back to you saying, to do what? What do they lack capacity to do? So are we automatically saying, if somebody is aggressive, violent, verbally, or harasses you, because they lack capacity, everyone uses the, the dementia patient as the easy scenario, um, as somebody who lacks capacity, because it is an easy one. We know the facets of the work that you do it's not the dementia patient who's lashing out. It is, it is important to say, lacks capacity to do what? Because somebody who lacks capacity about their care and treatment, which is the main decisions you should be asking the people here, is about their care and treatment. Do they lack capacity to understand that smacking you is the wrong thing to do? to verbally abusing you is the wrong thing to do. Because to me, that's a different set of questions than do you understand the treatment I'm going to give you? Do you understand the surgery you're about to go for? Do you understand the medicine I'm about to give you? These are two different things. And I would implore you, if you're treating someone who's being agitated with you, who's being aggressive with you, is to possibly, if possible, I know that's easier said than done, someone who's been in those situations myself, to ask those two very separate questions and see them two very separate situations. I'm not saying we're going to stop, as Vicky quite eloquently said, stop care and treatment for that person. However, it helps you with your case conferences, your rapid reviews, your conversations with your MDT to say, I actually think so-and-so is showing me they understand. Because if sticking a camera on someone makes them change the way that they're acting, it would suggest to me they have a level of understanding of what they're doing and what they're presenting with. With my other little hat as the chair of the BAME staff network, I do hear some of the um, issues that come from my colleagues from the BME background, and they do email the network and they do come to our network meetings and talk about, and I'm not talking about just clinical staff, we're talking about our porter staff, we're talking about our security staff, we're talking about staff across the whole of our hospital catering staff um, who are having to face-to-face -to -face deal with people in the community coming into our hospital in their day at work here at the hospital. 
So I've written here the guiding principles. This is the guiding principles of the Mental Health Act, but it does also cover the Capacity Act. I'm not going to sit and read through all my um, slide here, but it, it really is the embodiment. I mean, how I describe um, the Mental Health Act, it's a really old, archaic piece of legislation. It, it goes back, actually, into the 1800s. I won't sit here and go through my dissertation of when I wrote that. But, it, you know, it was updated in 1959, then 83, and then updated in 2007. And a lot of the, those laws and legislations are based in really old-fashioned archaic, and it was built for a psychiatric hospital. We have to try and make it work and fit for an acute hospital. And a lot of parts of that act, again, aren't built for how we work in acute the capacity I, I quite like because I think it's written quite nicely. And it's, it's only, you know, it's from 2005 and it's actually, I think, a bit piece of lovely legislation because actually it was, when it was actually put together in Parliament, it had a lot of people from a lot of charity sectors, a lot of the disability organisations helped to create that bit of legislation. And I like the fact that it's underpinned with five principles. So I am going to go through a bit of the Capacity Act. So what is mental capacity and when might you need to assess capacity. Having mental capacity means that a person is able to make their own decisions. You should always start from the assumption that the person has capacity to make the decision in a question. Principle one. You should also be able to show that you have made every effort to encourage and support the person to make the decision themselves. Principle two. You must always remember that if a person makes a decision which you consider to be eccentric or unwise, this does not necessarily mean that the person lacks capacity to make that decision. I hear that a lot about people that come in under the influence of drugs and alcohol. And I completely appreciate the um, ethics around that and people's personal values and beliefs around drugs and alcohol. We are not here to make those decisions on people's behalf about drugs and alcohol and, and their personal. However, obviously, that's different if it's affecting their ability to accept care. It's, the, it's different if that affects their ability to be civil and accept treatment whilst they're in hospital. But somebody leaving, by the way, and saying, I'm going to continue to take drugs, I am going to continue to do this thing, is, in my opinion, not an unwise decision. Well, <laughs> that necessarily makes uh, some images about my weekends. <laughs> um, under the NCA, you are required to make an assessment of capacity before carrying out any care or treatment. The more serious the decision, the more formal the assessment of capacity needs to be. So when should capacity be assessed? You might need to assess capacity where a person is unable to make a particular decision at a particular time because their mind or brain is affected by an illness or disability. People's situations may change and the capacity determination may need to be reviewed. You cannot decide that someone lacks capacity based on their age, their appearance, condition or behaviour alone. Now, I'm hoping that the room here is very familiar with the two-stage two test and the, the, um, the process of a capacity assessment, but I'm going to go through it again anyway. So we have had legislation, by the way, um, since the Capacity Act came out that has changed the way that we use some of the Capacity Act. So you will hear the words from my adult safeguarding colleagues saying about continuous supervision and control. That's when the deprivation of liberty safeguards came in. All most of this legislation is underpinned by the Human Rights Act, which I won't go through today. But by all means, email me because I'll quite happily wax lyrical about it with you. Um, <laughs> So, is the person able to make the decision with support if required? Now, whatever areas you come in, you're offering some form of treatment to somebody. I have been involved where I've been at, where someone said, I don't think so-and-so can make the decision regarding their cancer treatment. They lack capacity. This person did not speak English as a first language. Have we attempted where possible to get that information online or in that person's language so we can give them the best opportunity to this huge decision they've got to make about their life, have we done what's reasonably acceptable to get that information to them? That's the same with ABH. And Vicky was talking about those leaflets and the processes. Have we, if that person is, English again is not their first language, if that person has 
uh, dyslexia, if that person has any other kind of issues with, with understanding or learning that communication. We have speech and language therapists at our hospital. Do we need to involve them to get that through to that person as much as possible? If they cannot, is there an impairment or disturbance in the functioning of their mind or brain? Meaning, they, they use the word impairment and disturbance because they don't want to say straight away, is that, does that person have a mental disorder? Because the impairment and disturbance could be drugs, alcohol. So the Capacity Act completely covers all of those. It could be infection. It could be delirium. It does not have to be a mental disorder. Is the person's inability to make the decision because of the impairment or disturbance, the person is determined to, as unable to make the relevant decision if they are unable to understand information given to them, retain that information long enough to be able to make that decision, weigh up the information available to make that decision, to communicate their decision. This could be talking, using sign language, or even simple muscle movements, such as blinking an eye and squeezing a hand. The determination of a person's capacity is made on a balance of probabilities. It is more likely than not that the person lacks capacity. You should be able to show in your records why you have come to your conclusion that capacity is lacking for this particular decision. This also comes to free to leave. Now, I get this a lot of, is so-and-so allowed to leave the hospital? If I am in here, you lovely people just talking about staff on staff aggression, and I go to leave, what is stopping any of you? I don't know where there's two policemen in here, but there's, um, sorry, persons. Um, what is stopping me from leaving? Nothing. Nothing should stop me from leaving because none of you should be able to keep me here. We should have that same principle on a ward. And I get it, we're treating people. However, when we're talking about this very, and, and I'm aware it's very more complex, I'm saying it very plainly here. But that's where these rapid reviews, these case conferences come in. And I get involved with a lot of people. So and so, Shirley, is absconded off the ward. So and so, uh, we've placed a section 5 2 on so and so because they were trying to leave the ward. And sometimes I'll come to the ward and I'll speak to the doctor and I'll get some of them rescinded because we have to remember that the Mental Health Act is used for mental disorders or possible mental disorders, not for aggression and violence, not to control people's behaviour. And we have to go back to that unwise decision. Generally, people want a leg kick because they want a cigarette. And that's where I generally find everyone is because they've gone to have a smoke somewhere. Sticking a piece of legislation on someone, as I'll have said to many of you in the ward, is just making them more angry and aggressive. So have a think about that. And that's, again, and I, I, please don't take this the wrong way. I'm not sitting this as a, as a, as a point of uh, putting any blame to anyone because I'm involved in these conversations in the ward. I, I completely agree with what Vicky was saying about environment. We do have to think of the environment sometimes that we're in with people. And when we are built, and it's out of most of your hands, our ward rounds happen at a certain time. Medication comes around at a certain time. We're grabbing people's arms and doing blood pressure and tests at certain times. But when we are looking at that person's agitation, has that person had a load of drugs that we've pumped into them that they're sleepy, drowsy about? Uh, the therapy that they've just maybe had with our psychologists that have left them quite agitated. And then we're kind of adding on layers of that. You're, you're not me, we're not all social workers, but I'm, I'm aware of trauma and people, we're, we're seeing people in the community that are coming in with their own personal traumas. And I, I see such fantastic work when I go onto the ward and I know how difficult it is. And especially when one of yourselves are calling me, is generally something's happened on a ward and I will try and come and support you in your areas. There's only one of me when I can and, and, and if I can come up to the wards or areas. But... I do say to people, let's have a look at why we're keeping people, what legislation. And sometimes I'll speak to people, I spoke to someone the other day, and I won't say which board it was, and they said, uh, Shady, I think we need to stick someone on 5-2. And we talked through it, and it was, a, as a, it was an older lady who had delirium. So I said, well, why do we need a 5-2? She doesn't look like she's going to be detained. We don't, we've already had slight liaison come out. They didn't think she had a mental disorder that requires treatment, because that's what we're using the Mental Health Act. Is there a psychiatric disorder? Why do they need treatment? If they don't need treatment, let's move that aside. NCA. Well, she's delirium. She doesn't know what she's doing. 
and we're walking around and following her. But and every time she gets up, we have to sit her down, and she's one to one. Okay, do we have a dolls in place? No, no, no. We don't need a dolls. We just and I backtracked it a bit, I said, and we had a little laugh, and I said, what did you just tell me you're doing? We're telling her to sit down every time she gets up. That's continuous supervision and control. No, but she's not asking to go anywhere. But we're supervising and controlling her every movement. We need to have some legislation around that. We can't just control people. And she's not fighting, but that's, you know, I won't go too into the weeds and the nerdy bit of it, but that's where Dolls was born out of. There was a person... It called the Bournewood Gap, who wasn't actually asking to leave. He wasn't looking to leave. But they realised when it went to the human, you know, when it went to the European Courts of Human Rights, that actually that was illegal, that we were just keeping someone under, we weren't letting them have leave, we weren't letting them go. And, they were, and you, you guys have patients that are on there for months, weeks. And we have to think about, we're not telling or allowing people that they can leave. And if they try to leave, would we be going, no, 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 you can't leave Doris. I'm sorry, that's such a horrible stereotypical name of a certain age, but no, you can't leave Doris. You have to stay on the ward. Why? You can't keep me there. So that's why we need that. And it protects you and it protects the staff here. If you don't think it needs it to go through, my colleagues at the Adult Safe Garden should hopefully, I hope, are advising you about the best way forward. I'm sorry, I feel like I've gone, I've gone way over time, I apologise. Cheryl, I should stop talking. Yeah. I'm not going to go into the deal because I do feel like I've gone over to someone else's. I'm going to leave that up there. Is there any questions anyone has to me? I think it's just like, from my experience as an outdoor nature, there seems to be an awful lot of um, confusion about who can do safety. Everyone, anyone in this room. It's what I'm talking about, but yeah. there's a lot of um, fear around actually reducing one. Yeah. I don't. I. I completely hear you. And even as a community worker, I used to hear that a lot. Um, and you've got to think about in our care homes, the staff there are doing that every day. Our care home staff, who are you know, we're our, our most underpaid forces of kind of workers out there. But I, I hear that a lot when I go to the wards and, you know, and I, I encourage my, and I hear this from the, and I'm not, I am classified as an AHP, so I'm not dragging on my AHP colleagues, but I hear this from my AHP colleagues a lot. And to me, if you were a physiotherapist, this actually came up but last week that I had to email an area and a physiotherapist was expecting a doctor to make the decision of an MCA when it was regarding physical care, it was regarding that person refusing therapy. And I said, no, 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 that goes back to the physiotherapist because they're physically wanting to move someone's limbs. They need to do, it's your area of expertise. If you're a physiotherapist, it's your, you know, you have to balance that level of probability. Is it in the person's best, best interest? So I have been involved with an older adult chap who was refusing showers when I used to work in the community. And I got into this big discussion with the district nurse and she said he's he refusing showers and smack, he used to be an ex-boxer. So he was actually used to be smacking the carers that would try and wash him. So we had a meeting about this and I said, but okay, he lacks capacity, clearly, dementia. But was it in his best interest to actually forcibly grab this elderly gentleman and shower him because it was the right thing to do? No, not really, not on the balance of the risks to him, the risks to the carers. It, you know, when we negotiated him having washers, which were a bit simpler, and his wife was able to help him, we felt more comfortable with. But actually, just because that's the process doesn't mean we should be doing it. How can we change things slightly? But sorry, I went way off your question. Um, the MCA is everybody's business, and the, the, the beginning of the, the Capacity Act says that. It is everybody's business. Everyone should be doing it, so... By all means, tell them to email me if anyone's questioning it. Oh, sorry, the safeguarding team. They, they hold it in their, their portfolio. But I'm always happy to talk about that with people. Thank you, Sean. Unless there's anybody else, I'm going to go, because I'm sorry, Cheryl, I did go over. Mm -hmm.